of you have had people, friends, that were on fire at one time they dropped out? Can you think of it? It's, it's hard when it's the guy that led you to Christ. And somehow he drops out or whatever happens. And so it's very important that we, uh, we, we, we make right choices and decisions that I'm with you no matter what. See, we got a friend in, in jail right now. You might have heard of him. His name's Andrew Brunson. He's in jail in Turkey. And it's been on Fox News and the whole thing. President Trump was talking to Erdogan about it, and Mike Pence was talking to them about it. And, and there's, a, there's a big move trying to get him out. He's been in jail for nine months, charged with espionage. He's been in Turkey 23 years and serve that nation. He's trying to work out, God, is, am I ever going to get out of here? And, uh, you know, when you're in that kind of a place, you got to have some sort of a foundation under you. He's in an overcrowded cell that was made for eight people, and there's 20 in it. Wow. And he's the only Christian, and all the others consider him unclean. Aren't you glad you're in church this morning? <laughs> so we're all praying for Andrew to get out. And President Trump apparently brought it up two or three times. Hey, if we're going to get along, you need to let our guy out of jail. That's good, isn't it? Yes. Turn to somebody and say, I'm really thankful for all the good things God's poured into my life of late. But <clears throat> I feel like I want to talk to you for a few moments about life's journey. And life is a bit of a convoluted journey, <clears throat> meaning it doesn't always make sense. So let me read a couple of scriptures to you. First of all, let's go to Romans chapter 8. In verse 28, most of you know it off by heart, but it says, all things work together for the good to those who love God and to those who are called according to his purpose. For who he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed. Uh, such a great scripture. The whole chapter, Romans 8, is absolutely amazing. Let's say that with me. All things, All things work, together work together for the good, for the good. to those who love God and to those who are called according to his purpose. Who he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son. So, Jesus has got you on a track that you're going to end up looking more and more like him. You're going to become more and more like him. You're going to smell more and more like him and behave more and more like him. It's a really, really good journey. But how many of you know you're not there yet? <laughs> not quite, right? Now, at one level, we are. We're saved, die today, heaven is your home. Why? Because you believed in the name of the Son of God. You knew that he died on the cross for you. And by the way, young people, be, be cautious about all the new teaching that's out there that is kind of like into the hyper grace side of thing that would tell you anything goes now that you're saved because Jesus paid it all. There is a call for holiness. And it's really an issue of the heart. Are you trying to work this thing so you can get away with sin? Or are you really hating the old life, you know? See, the universalism is not the answer. <clears throat> and uh, this is just for free. This is not part of the message. <laughs> but um, when we don't make a practice of, of taking on board the entire word of God, then you can fall into these things when you start picking and choosing, and you think, oh, well, that part's not really inspired, but this part is, and this part is. 
And it's because you can't reconcile the, the, the challenges. But the, the whole Bible, the entire Bible, is the Word of God. From cover to cover and everything in between. But it's not enough just to blindly accept that and say, that's, that's my stand and I, I don't deviate from it. No, you need to check it out. You need to understand. No, you can prove the Bible. Did you know that? You can prove it through archaeology. You can prove it um, prophetically. Do you know all the prophecies that came true when Jesus came on the scene? It's incredible. Absolutely incredible. If somebody said, like what? Like, name one. What would you say? Born of a virgin. Yeah. See, if, it, if Mary was not a virgin, uh, the whole thing falls apart right at that point because he's not God after all. He's the son of whoever. So, um, yeah. One I like is, is from Daniel chapter 9 or 10, I think, and I think it's 9, where, where the angel said, from the going forth of the commandment until the coming of Messiah, the king, will be X number of years, like sevens and all these years of uh, 70 sevens and so on and so on. And, and when you do the math... Guess what? It comes out right to the very day that Jesus rode the donkey into Jerusalem and proclaimed himself king. Amazing. There's an excellent little book called uh, uh, The King, The Coming Prince. It was written by the head of Scotland Yard, a devout believer, published his book in 1895, and worked out all the math, and it's still true today. Incredible. And it, it was from the going forth of the building of the city of Jerusalem, when Artaxerxes made that proclamation, and right to the day Jesus rides in. Isn't that awesome? What's the chances of that? And then there's many, many of them, of course. You can prove it through uh, Bible prophecy. You can prove it archaeologically, you can, you can prove it textually. There's no contradictions, really. And when you think you've found one, that's an opportunity to dig deep and you, and you find a rich treasure when you get the answer to it. It's amazing to me. Even the Bible text itself. Do you guys do that? Do you dig in? Um, a couple of years ago, I had the Lord say to me, John, I want you to strengthen your faith in the Word of God. Well, it surprised me, you know, I thought, Lord, I totally believe the Word of God. Uh, but he said it again. I want you to strengthen your faith in the Word of God. So I started listening to sort of favorite Bible teachers that are a bit outside my stream, like Ravi Zachariah, tremendous apologist, Chuck Missler, tremendous man of God. Do you guys listen to Chuck Missler ever? Yeah? They put all his stuff up on YouTube. It's all, it's all kind of free. And he's a very brilliant man. I mean, he was in the, the U.S. Air Force, and then he, he was the head of, I think, three or four different defense contractors, and from there he headed up the computer division in Ford Motor Company, and left it all to do the love of his life, which is teaching the Bible. And he's very easy to listen to, because so he's like, don't take my word for it, do your own research and draw your own conclusions. But anyway, he led this one, uh, <clears throat> called A Study in Matthew, and it blew my mind. I've watched this maybe five, six times. How many would like to have your mind blown by the Bible? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. YouTube, Chuck Missler, M-I-S-S-L-E-R, Matthew Series, Session 1. My gosh. <laughs> he gets into the work of this Russian mathematician by the name of Ivan Painin. And he came to America in 1880-whatever, went to Harvard, graduated PhD in mathematics, and got saved at Harvard, which is novel, isn't it? <laughs> and uh, <coughs> spent the next 50 years of his life studying the mathematics of the Greek New Testament. Wow. Mm. 
And what he found is the signature of God on pretty much every page. Patterns of sevens and recurring patterns of sevens. It just blew my mind. So it's, there's lots of really good stuff going on up there, you know. And you need to satisfy yourself that it's not just parts of this inspired. It is inspired from cover to cover. You know what Jesus said about it? It is easier for heaven and earth to pass away than for one letter of the law to fail. He didn't say letter. He said one tittle, one jot or tittle. And a tittle is actually a serif on one of the Hebrew characters, like the little fancy bit. Even that's inspired, according to what he said. So see, be very careful before you start discounting scripture. It's okay to say, I don't understand it. And I always follow that up with, Lord, will you show me what this really means? And so tell somebody, the Bible's true from cover to cover. And the sooner you learn that, the better. <clears throat> anyway, we've got our basic questions answered. Who am I? Why am I here? Where am I going? And you, you, know, you come to the Lord and you get an answer. Hey, I made it in the image of God. He has a plan for my life. Uh, and I go to heaven when I die and I owe him nothing because all my sins are forgiven. And, and so you need to really fully understand the cross as well. See, the cross is God's idea compared to what some of the voices are saying these days. It's God's idea. You know why? He's perfect in all his ways. What are the implications of God being perfect in all his ways? How does that impact you and me? See, one false move, you're in trouble. Now that's not because he's mean, he's not, he's loving. But, he, but he's perfect in all his ways. So when I hurt you, not only are you upset, he's upset. Why? Because it's unjust. And when you hurt me, not only am I upset, but he's upset because what you did was wrong, you see. And so all of us have got this accumulation of hurt on the one hand where we've been sinned against and sin on the other hand where we've hurt other people. Anybody here been sinned against? Ever? Ever been hurt by another person? You know, father, mother, man in your life. Women in your life, all that kind of thing. And so what do we do about it? This outstanding debt. This is just this accumulation of a huge debt. And before the world was formed, we came up with a solution already. Jesus, the Son of God, will come to earth as a man, and he'll actually pay off your debt with his life if you ask him to. It's not automatic. But if you hear the good news and say, be my savior, forgive my sin, then he includes you. And you go from death to life, not based on how good or not good you were, but based on you putting your faith in him. And it empowers you to turn away from uh, hurting others and sinning and doing your own thing and all that to want to now become Christ-like. Does that make sense? So when you see God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. You're that important to him. It's just incredible. Ravi Zacharias had a team in Pakistan <clears throat> a couple of years back. And they met up with all the, the, the important people in government and religion and the, and the universities and so on. And 
and they were all there. They're all Muslim, of course. And, and one of them spoke up to him and said, how can you possibly believe that God could die on a cross? What kind of a God could have his life taken from him like that? And uh, that's why we can't believe in it, that kind of a thing. So they spoke up and they said, well, actually, there's a deeper question. And that question is, why would you serve a God who cared absolutely nothing about you? Yeah. See, because our God cared enough about you to go and pay the ultimate price, paid off your debt himself, satisfied the justice level, so that now you could be invited into grace. And in the end, almost every one of those men came to Christ. That's amazing. See, there's, there's apologetics out there that make sense of all this stuff. And you, if that's important to you, you can read uh, some of his things. You can read books like More Than a Conqueror uh, and, and get answers to the practicalities of why our faith is not only works, but it is the only way. Because the one who is so valuable, you cannot estimate how valuable he is, he paid our debt collectively and individually when he gave his life, yeah? And so now the whole point is you and I becoming more like him. How many want to do that? Whatever it takes, Lord. That's where it gets interesting. So let's uh, move on from the basic answers. And you, you, know, you get down to the fact that as we go through life, well, Christianity sometimes has been accused of having final answers, but not much help for the in-between. In other words, you took care of our past, my sins are gone, you took care of our future and going to heaven with my when I die. But, you know, I, I feel like I'm on my own almost, uh, living life. And God, where are you when I need you? You ever felt that way? How many have? And so, see, now we need not just a theology for success and and triumph, but we also need a theology for adversity. When things go wrong, he is still there for you. And we need to know that because everything is going to work together for good to those who love him. So the popular theology that would go along with that <clears throat> would sound something like this. If I can just figure it out and get it all right, uh, if I can pray enough, study the word enough, give enough, share Christ enough, attend church enough, be good enough, do this, that, or the other enough, then life is going to be a walk in the park for me. Because after all, the favor of God's resting on my life, and I go to this joy church, and you know, it's just all, it's just all wonderful. And then when problems hit, um, we're trying to make sense of it. Come on, I believe in divine healing. I believe in divine health. Why, why, is, why, why did my cartilage go out? Why did this happen? Why did the other happen? Why? And we're trying to make sense of adversity. But listen to the words of Jesus from John 16, 33. I bet you anything, you don't have this one up on your fridge or your bathroom mirror. It says this, in the world, you will have tribulation. What's that mean? Trouble. But, be of good cheer, I've overcome the world. Okay, turn to somebody and say, hey, in the world, you're going to have trouble. But never mind. He's overcome the world. And as we bring this uh, 
in as well as all the other stuff, and this becomes part of life, it lifts the confusion because when you're going through it, you're confused because you know that it's not supposed to be this way if you're not in victory, right? I want to help you get rid of that confusion. You know, we could read the parable from Matthew 7 about the wise man built his house upon the rock. Do you do that in your children's church here? You know, in the Baptist Sunday school, I remember we all did it. You know, the wise man builds his house upon the rock. The foolish man built his house upon the sand. Rains came down and the floods came up. Uh, but the house on the rock stood firm. Well, when you build on the rock, uh, you're going to stand firm. But here's the point. The rains come and the floods come, and the wind blows on both those houses, everybody's house. It's just that one has a foundation that's solid enough to hold you. So that's the look we're going for. It's your foundation that's going to make the difference. How many want to be founded on the rock, Christ Jesus? Man, I'm telling you. And Hebrews says, even he learned obedience through the things he suffered. Let me give you another verse. Psalm 34, 19, okay, says this. Many are the afflictions of the righteous. Ooh. You know, I'm okay with once in a while, but many? But you got to hear the but. But the Lord delivers him out of them all. So you just need to hang on, see? And meanwhile, he's working good stuff into your heart. And so, you know, when we begin to look at life, if you take a historical view, we live in a fallen planet. There's just been problem after problem, difficulty after difficulty coming upon the earth. Just, just a fact. I, I don't know why one day I looked up all the... British wars, because I have a British background. My grandparents, great-grandparents all came from England, so I was interested in British wars. So I look it up on um, Google, and I just can't believe how many thousands of wars there are that, it, that Britain has been involved in. And you think, what was the point of all that? Didn't prove anything. It's just trouble going on in the earth. Many times wars have happened that have quenched revival. And, and, and the whole earth is like that. Let's take a biblical perspective. Creation, Garden of Eden, thrown out. What's your, what's your picture on that? Do you ever think about that? Adam and Eve. The visual I used to get was was. God, Father God, all red in the face, angry, uh, saying to Adam and Eve, I told you not to eat that fruit and went ahead and did it. Now get out of here. But I don't have that picture anymore. Because see, what was really going on, there's two trees in that garden. Tree of life, tree of knowledge of good and evil. And it's like, oh, guys, you did what I told you not to do. So you know what, now I have to put you out of here, because if I leave you here, you'll eventually eat from the tree of life, and you will live eternally in a fallen state, just like Satan. So I gotta put you out where you go through adversity, but I have a plan. A savior will come, yeah? And so that's been the story, you know, it just, out they go, and they're all right for a while, and then it just gets worse and worse and worse till Noah's time. And the Lord's like, I vey. I wish I had never even created them on the earth. <laughs> but Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Okay, we're going to rescue Noah. And so we have this massive flood. And the, the seven are rescued from that. Do you know... Um, 
You can prove the flood happened historically. More and more scientists are realizing there's nothing else that will explain the Grand Canyon, for example, as this massive runoff that eroded the thing. But there's hundreds of things. There's a book called, I think it's called The Flood or Noah's Flood, something like that. It, it just investigates all the scientific evidence and it's very helpful for people who have fallen into the whole evolutionary deal. How many of you know you didn't come from a swamp or a, a flash of lightning hitting a, a mud pile or whatever? <laughs> You're created in the image of God. More and more top scientists now are, are believers in, uh, in, in creation in as much as it's intelligent design. You know, I put a nail in that whole thing finally was um, the human genome and uh, the blueprint of how to make a human being like you. It is so complex that they're like, there's no way this could just happen. It's good, isn't it? You gotta throw that lie off or it'll water down your, you know, it just makes you think that, I wonder if it really is true or not. No, it's not true at all. More and more top scientists are believing in uh, intelligent design. Do you believe in intelligent design? I mean, just take any part of you, you know, your eyes, your ears, your, your blood circulation, your heart. I mean, you're a miracle. You're made in the image of God. And you're just one. I mean, you can take any of the thousands of different animals and species, every one of them is a miracle. And they're all beautiful. It's incredible, isn't it? How is it that we're so easily blinded by a college professor who hates God, you know? We, we, we need to come back to basics here. But what do you think is going on? I can remember saying, what's going on, God? You know, we, we left Stratford and moved to Toronto because we wanted to take the city. And uh, we're, we're believing for mighty signs and wonders. We still are. And, and hey, we're just messing around with this, that, fighting all these little fires and opposition and problems here and there. God, if you're serious about taking the city, you know, I, I got a couple of ideas I'd like to run by you that you, you, know, you might think about. Just raise up, you know, a hundred people just like Jesus and turn them loose on the planet. And that would do it, wouldn't it? And it just really got me thinking. I thought, you know, there's pretty much a billion born again believers on earth today, all over the world. You know, the church is growing like crazy in developing countries. I was just in Kenya, there's 85% Christian. And I, I was in Ghana, which is like 60% Christian. And uh, Iran is having a mighty revival in Iran of all places. And so it goes, China. 30,000 new believers every day, and it's been going on for 30 years. So it is happening, but that was still my question. And I worked out that the Lord is not just interested in getting the job done, so to speak, because as I went through that, I thought, Lord, if you just took 1% of the Christians and anointed them like Jesus, um, what would that look like? And I realized, you know, we could wrap this Great Commission thing up in about 30 days. Just have a suddenly, boom, 1% of us are doing the miracles like Jesus did. Can you imagine? But he doesn't do that. Why? Because his mission goes beyond just harvesting the earth and saving the lost. He wants to raise up you as a son and a daughter of God so that you will walk in his image and reflect his likeness and show forth his glory. So it brought me down to like all the biblical characters. So who's your favorite? 
You have a favorite Bible character? Who? You said David? How many like David? You mean the guy that got another man's wife pregnant and then had him killed? That guy? Would you, would you buy his book, actually? The Psalms? <laughs> yeah, I love David, too. Why? Because he was a man after God's own heart. He didn't blame shift. He didn't go, no, 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 that wasn't me. No, he ran to the Lord. Tears running, streaming down his face, repented. Who else is your favorite? Joshua. John in the New Testament. Peter in the New Testament. Who? Paul in the New Testament. Elijah. Esther. Deborah. Who? Moses. All right. These are all good. Anybody like Joseph? Anybody want Joseph's anointing? Hey, you know how you get Joseph's anointing? <laughs> you know, your family hates you so much they will want to kill you, but they settle for selling you into slavery. And there you are. It went okay at first, but then he spent 13 years in an Egyptian prison. And his heart was still toward God. Do you imagine? Well done, Joseph. Now I want you to think of one who had absolutely no adversity and no problems. <laughs> Enoch. Let's think about that. Enoch lived in the time of Noah. And it was so bad that God says, I'm sorry I even made these guys. I think he had his fair share of problems, although scripture doesn't say one way or the other. He chose to walk with God, and, and God airlifted him out. So I don't know if he counts. <laughs> But think of one who had no problem. See, these are the heroes of the faith. These are our models. And people go through adversity. And the, and the issue is not whether you went through it or not, but whether you came out the other side intact. In the world, you will have tribulation. Be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. My personal story is that <clears throat> the worst thing that ever happened to me was the failure of my first marriage. Because there went my dream, really, of ever being in the ministry. So I thought. And this is back in the 70s, you know. I, I went to Israel for the first time in 1974. And we went to this Jerusalem conference, and David Duplessis was there. And I was so pumped about it. I'm like, wow go to the Holy Land. I've got to fast and pray. I want to water fast for three weeks. And I went there and uh, I, primarily because Catherine Kuhlman was one of the speakers. So that was all a bonus. And she was fantastic, of course. But it wasn't so much her, but a guy named David Duplessis that got me. And he was, he was preaching the love of God. It was the beginning of a profound, life-changing revelation that came to my heart about the love of God. Because I'm looking in this great Congress hall, and he's got the platform all full of Catholic priests and Anglican priests and nuns and all these clergy, and I'm thinking, what are they doing up there? They're not even saved, probably, those people. <laughs> <laughs> well, then in his message, he's like, now, some of you are sitting in judgment about your brothers and sisters, and he's, he's reading John 17, you know, that's his text. And he says, my question to you is, why can't you love them? And he hammered that home, and I felt like he shot me full of arrows. Oh, 
arrows of conviction and truth. And I, and I fell apart there publicly in that, in that meeting. Again and again, I couldn't get it together the whole week. And I'm not normally like that. I'm usually more or less together. Have you ever lost it publicly to where you were a blithering, sobbing, wailing basket case in front of everybody and you couldn't stop? I mean, the guy I was with, he's like, Sean, you know, I don't know. Really get it together here. But I, I was just undone by the Holy Spirit. I had one of the greatest encounters of my life because I'd go home to the room and just be reflecting on it all and then these waves of glory would start crashing down on me. Ah, oh, it was amazing. I thought I was going to die. I didn't die, obviously. But you know, I went home from that, um, transformed, changed into... My worst nightmare, you know, the whole, my whole marriage is falling apart. Long story short, the more I tried to fix it, the worse it got, and I end up being Mr. Mom. And my two girls, Lori and Vicki, we moved back to our city, Toronto, and tried to start again. But got in business, and away we went, you know, with different business. And and we tried to pull things together. But see, it's really hard when you figure there goes your dream. See, I'd been to Bible school, three years of that, waiting for the opening, waiting for, you know, just something to, God to do something so I could get into ministry. Anybody in that place here, sort of waiting for that open door, waiting for that opportunity? Anybody in here? Wave at heaven, say, don't forget me, I'm still here, yeah, I'm waiting for that door. And we need to help each other with all of that, by the way. <clears throat> but anyhow, um, I had a dear pastor, a uh, previous pastor and a mentor of mine, his name's Alec Ness. And, and he said to me one time in a meeting, he said, John, whatever happened to your love for souls? So I said, well, I still have that. He said, then you, you need to go for it. I said, well, Pastor Ness, how can I? Because who wants a divorced pastor? Do you know what he said to me? He says, listen, half this country's divorced. Go minister to that half. Yeah. <laughs> See, he knew my heart. He knew that, yeah, he just knew me. He knew my heart. He wasn't excusing sin, uh, but he knew my heart. And he said, you need to go for it. And so I said, wow, we need to go for it. Okay, so... Anyway, I met Carol. We got married in June of 1979. So coming up is our 38th, am I right, anniversary? And um, a year later, we took a mission trip to Indonesia, and those people just so wrecked us with their love. You know, they didn't know we were in business, and that was our life. They thought we, we were these evangelists from Canada, and they planned all these meetings, and it was, oh my gosh, it was just incredible, but they loved us. Mm. I've never been impacted like, like that, and we came home in tears on the airplane and said, we'll do anything. We'll go anywhere. We'll do anything. I'm not sure you should let them hear you say that, <laughs> or anyone who said it. <laughs> And he said, good, I want you to go to Carol's hometown and plant a charismatic church. And we're like, no, not there. <laughs> well, you said it anyway. Okay, I'll go. I didn't want to go there because number one, there was too much snow, in my opinion. But number two, everybody knew her. Carol was sort of well-known in the community. Her first husband was a prominent businessman. And word went around, Carol's back. Really, what's she doing? Well, she's back with her new husband. Oh, what are they doing? They started a church. They what? <laughs> so we were the new cult in town. And anyway, we still have a wonderful church there. 
And we've just moved back to Stratford as a, yeah, another story. But anyway, that church is doing really, really great. So there are people along the way that will help you get through it. That's my point. But I want you to have a theology for adversity, but I don't want you to have faith for adversity. I want you to have faith that you'll go through it to the other side to your breakthrough. Because it turned out marrying Carol was one of the best things I've ever done next to having Jesus and being filled with the Holy Spirit. And just the way it was before, that there's no way I could have led um, a world revival. There just was no way at all. Um, R.T. Kendall, do you guys know him? Yes. He said to me one time, he said, John, did you ever thank God for unanswered prayer? R.T., what a provoking thought that is. I said, no, I don't think I ever have, but I can think of a couple of things right now. <laughs> See, because he always causes uh, good to come around so long as your faith is still intact. You know, you could, this is Catherine Kuhlman country here. We were just in Youngstown where she had her church. She's one of my heroes, and she's been gone for 40 years. And so most of you never had the privilege of hearing her. Is that right? Anybody here ever ever hear her and sit under her ministry? Wow. And she'd open that radio program every day. And we'd get it all the way up in Toronto, you know. Wheeling, West Virginia, WWVA. Catherine Kuhlman, come on, 15-minute radio show. Wow. Hello there. <laughs> And have you been waiting for me? <laughs> oh, that's so nice of you. And remember, so long as God is still on his throne and hears and answers prayer, and just so long as your faith in him is still intact, everything will come out all right. <laughs> And I could, I'd be hearing that, you know, I'd be going to Bible school, working the night shift, recorder on my cassette player and all that kind of stuff. And everybody, well, you just hurry on and get past that old <laughs> intro and get to the good stuff. And it's the intro that I remember now. <laughs> Key point. Just so long as your faith in him is still intact. So I could reword that and say, what would life have to do to you? What would the devil have to do to you to buy you off and get you to quit? How many shots to the head can you take before it's like enough? Is there anybody here that's never had adversity? Don't worry, he'll get around to you. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's just so amazing. But when you, when you think of uh, some of the New Testament guys we talked about, Peter, James, John, you know, um, Peter, James, John, they were the top three, Jesus specially trained those three, right? They were in the inner circle. They were in the Mount of Transfiguration. They, they, you know, they just had privilege that even the rest of the 12 didn't have, or certainly the 120 didn't have, and the 70 didn't have, and all that. And, you know, when I read about how James, his life was taken early on. Did you ever read that? James, young guy, and early in the, in the history of the church, Herod had him killed. So James, one of the top three. 
And then Peter's in prison. Now, if you were his mother or his family or his best friend, what would you say? Can you explain this to me, please? You know, spent all that time training him, and then he's taken from us like, I don't know, a year or whatever. Just doesn't make any sense in the natural. So we're so earthbound in our view, you know. And Jesus was the opposite. He said, like, God, ah, it's just this life. No big deal. Don't worry about it. But we, all we really know is here. And, and it's very short, by the way. Now, see, I can remember my dad telling me that. Life's short, son. Life's short. So I'd be like, yeah, probably is for you. But I've got my whole life ahead of me. I'm not even 20 yet, Dad. I'm only like 18. And uh, yeah, I can hardly see the end of it. And so I think you, when you hit about 50, you start to, it starts to dawn on you that, wow, how did I get here? Life is short. Even 30 is a bit of a wake-up call, you know. You're not a 20-something anymore. It's 30. Then 40, 50. 30 hit me, 50 hit me, 70 hit me. My next one is going to be 80. 80? How many are degree? 80 is old. You know, but when you hit 80, they make you retake your driving test and all kinds of stuff. But... If you're going to live forever, how old is old? See, we got just a little short time here to make an impact on him. And when it's your turn to go through the valley of the shadow of death or whatever, see, sometimes we bring it on ourselves. You do stupid things, then you know, you, you, you can deserve it then. It came your way because, yeah. But sometimes things happen that are totally beyond your control. And you wonder, God, where are you? And the worst thing you can do is start blaming him and questioning his goodness. That's exactly what the enemy wants you to do because he knows the effect of it. Right? Think about the apostles. Do you know every one of them, except one, died a martyr's death? It's not fun being a martyr. I was so impacted. It was a few years ago now, we ministered, Carol and I did, for the first time to the persecuted church. The first group was a group from Iran. <clears throat> and so we arranged to have a leader school for Iranians. And uh, we gathered them all that were expatriates who lived in Europe, but we, we, we raised money to bring 30 of them out of Iran, and we flew them to all different cities, and we met up in Turkey at this secret spot, and we had a school with them. And the ones that were from Iran, many of them were fresh out of prison. And I looked at those people, and this one girl, one beautiful girl, 27 or so, she had a big scar on her face, all up and down her arms, cuts. They said, she said her legs and her back was the same. And what they would do would be cut her and squeeze lemon juice in, and say, all this can go away. Just renounce Jesus and you go home tomorrow. And she would say, I can't possibly do that. He's, he's the best thing that ever happened to me. I'm sorry you don't agree, but no. like You're just going to have to do what you do, but I will never deny him. Well, they cut her to ribbons and squeezed lemon juice in and tortured her. And eventually she got out, I don't know how, and here she is in our school. And I'm up there in the front teaching them about the importance of forgiveness. What's our reference point in the importance of forgiveness? 
you ought to forgive your dad because he wouldn't loan you the car that night or something. And here they are, forgiving their persecutors, forgiving their torturers. It was unbelievable. Unbelievable to me. What people will hold on to. You see, we, we, we lay hold on this stuff called entitlement. And we think, no, no, we're entitled to this. And we, we claim the promises and everything. Then when something goes south, we're like, what the heck? Where are you, God? You said, you promised. You blah, 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 blah. Instead of just saying, I'm going through this too for the glory of God. You know? And when you read about the history of the Mars, the next one was trip to India. And I was asked by a guy named Jossie Chaco to go and <clears throat> do a leader school with them. And it was new, this whole approach of the heart and everything was new to him. But he's a tremendous church planter. And at that time, in something like eight or nine years, he'd planted 12,000 churches in India. It's probably up to 20,000 by now, because this was two or three years ago. Anyway, in, in we go. And uh, there's, there's a little girl there who is just like stone. And, uh, you know, my heart went out for her. And uh, I, I said, what, what, what is it with this girl? Like, tell me her story. And uh, so they said, yeah, she's got a really bad history. Um, her father sold her as a bride to a wealthy pedophile when she was three years old. And then when she turned 12, he kicked her out. So it was like, this is no longer your home, go. And she's out on the street, 12. And Christians found her and brought her home and told her about Jesus and got her going. And, and now she's a pastor trying to do a little village church. But here she is emotionally like a stone shut down. And I'm like, God, I've got to reach this girl. And the ministry time came, you know, and, and we, we were in a church that seemed like no bigger than this with a thousand people in it. It was just ridiculously packed. But anyway, we went out onto the basketball court to pray for them all. And I came to this one girl laying hands on her, and it's nothing, 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 nothing. I feel like I'm laying hands on a rock. And, and I'm, I can remember saying, God, if you ever use me just one more time to impart the anointing to someone, let it be this girl. And I'm just standing there like 10 minutes or more, soaking her. Finally, she fell to the ground. So I'm like, okay, at least she's down. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> carry on praying for more people. And, and I came back and she's still there. So I'm just blessing it, you know. Get her, God, you know, get her. And uh, the next thing, she exploded in laughter. Just exploded. And that went on for the longest while, 20 minutes. And um, yeah, so I said to her after, so what happened to you? And she's like, oh, it's, it's good, it's good, it's good, it's good. I said to her, can I, may I do something with you that is totally against your culture, but I, but I feel like I am to give you a father's hug. And see, in, in India, Men don't touch women, vice versa. They, they tend to sit on one side. Men and boys one side, women and children on the other, you know. <clears throat> anyway, she said yes. So I just wrapped her up in my arms and with the interpreter there, I just said everything I could think of to her. What a treasure you are. You, what a wonderful daughter. You know, we're so proud of you, come on opening your heart and letting love come in and blah, blah, blah. And I just went on and on and said everything I could think of. She just stood there weeping quietly. But later she came back to me and she said, Pastor, when you hugged me, something very dark lifted off of me. 
So can you imagine if you've never known love? Um, the father who should have taught you love was too broken, too poor, too whatever. One more child, one more girl, what do we do? Why not sell her? Here's a guy that'll buy a girl. And then even he kicks her out. So what's her reference point of God the Father who loves? You know, she just can't do it. Jesus who saves? All right, I'm in. But it's more than that, isn't it? It's you get saved so you can love from your heart. How many of you have been in a bit of confusion because life has not been going the way it sh you feel like it should be going. And please don't be embarrassed by this because the whole secret is, is, is just coming out in the light with it, getting real about it. And that, that way, uh, others will gather around you and they'll, they'll help you. Thank God I had some helpful friends when I went through my trouble. Let's all stand, shall we? <clears throat> See, Paul the Apostle had trouble too, didn't he? One good thing there, Jesus told him up front, he's going to suffer for his namesake. It's nice that, oh, somebody told you, hey, it's going to be a walk in the park once you give your life to Jesus. I'm sorry about that, but they didn't tell you the whole story. <laughs> <clears throat> yeah, Paul knew what it was to be whipped and beaten and all of his troubles. But if that's you, you say, John, the truth is I've been a bit confused and a bit discouraged because of what I've been going through. Everybody around me, it seems to work for them, but I can't make it work for me. Because, you know, have you ever had a bad week? You lost your job, you wrecked your car, you injured yourself, I mean, just one thing after another. We, we like to think about, no, no, I had a great week. I got a promotion at work, I got a better job, I got a newer car, I got a this or that. We have those too. But it's when you're down that you're vulnerable to a degree, to the enemy. And that's when you need to make a decision. No way do I cave in. I am not for sale. I belong to him who purchased me. So if, if that's you, just unashamedly raise your hand right now and say, yeah, truth is, I'm a little discouraged at the moment. Unashamedly, yeah. Okay, I'm going to ask you to just, just come on out and gather around. <clears throat> now, why this is important is because you're special to him. Right? And uh, just come a little closer, everybody. <clears throat> And you know what? You're going to be on the other side of this thing before you know it. Mm -hmm. um, not only that, in the bigger picture, a massive harvest is about to sweep oh, America. Oh, yeah. oh, mm -hmm. You're going to be having more fun than you ever imagined pretty soon. And so the seasoning that goes along with character development See, because Joseph was such a great leader because he was seasoned mm -hmm. and he passed the test. Yeah. And David was such a great leader <clears throat> because he was seasoned, he passed the test. You know, it started with David. It looked pretty good. He killed the lion, killed the bear. Next thing you know, he kills Goliath. He's promoted in the army. He marries the king's daughter. Hey, does it get any better than that? Until so the king gets jealous of you and then he's got a most wanted sign over your head when you run mm. for your life. And finally, he says, you know, we got to go, we got to get out of the country. And he goes over to the Philistine camp and takes all his men with him. Then the day comes they want to go to battle. 
So David's like, all right, this is it. I guess we got to go fight with the Philistines. And so they show up, and the, and the Philistines go, nothing doing. We're not having him. He's apt to fight for the other side when, you know, things get tense. So they send him home. And what's he find? Ziklag's been burned. Mm -hmm. The stuff is gone. The wives are gone. The kids are gone. Everything's gone. And his own men are saying, we must have been crazy to follow you. What a loser. We want to stone you. And what did David do? He encouraged himself in the Lord. See, when, it re when you really hit bottom, you want to encourage yourself in the Lord. And what did the Lord say? Go after them. Recover everything. And see, overnight, they got their stuff back, their kids back, their wives back, mm -hmm. and Saul died in the battle, and David's king over Judah. What a difference a day can make, right? Mm -hmm. Hang on, friends. Hang on. He, he knows every bit about you. He knows you're going out, you're coming in, and you're very, very precious to him. He's appointed you to salvation from the foundation of the world. And no one can take you out of his hand except you yourself. You can opt out. Don't do that. Just tell him, Jesus, I'm in. Good, bad, or indifferent, I'm in. And nothing is going to separate me from the love yeah. of God, which is in Christ Jesus. <clears throat> now, you know what's helpful is to start forgiving. Because usually it's, there's a people connection somewhere. Why did my husband leave me? Why did my... Why did the boss fire me? Why did the kids turn on me? Why did... And then it's like, God, why did you allow it? You're supposed to be all powerful. Why didn't you stop it? Well, sometimes he does. Sometimes he doesn't. But he always causes it to come around and, and weave into your life qualities and, and things that make you a better person because at the end of the day, he loves you. That's what you gotta get. Foundation stone in your hearts that we're building our lives on is the fact that God Almighty loves you. Jesus said the Father himself loves you. He wants the best for you. So, well, why does he allow all this hardship going on? Well, because he's preparing you to be a leader. And uh, scripture says, um, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a few things. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to make you ruler over cities. <laughs> Ruler over cities. Are you kidding me? Me? Uh-huh. Just like Joseph, you know. Who's Joseph? He's a nobody. He's a Hebrew slave, for goodness sake. Next thing you know, he's prime minister of Egypt. I want you to get your eyes on the purposes and the plans of God. Say it with me. Lord Jesus, I choose to forget every person that has hurt me and knocked me off course. I give them a gift that they do not deserve. I give them my forgiveness. Just like you gave me your forgiveness. And I did not deserve it. Pull all that 
confusion out of my heart and mind right now. I declare your grace is sufficient for me. It'll get me from earth to glory. Yeah, we're well on our way. Lord, I just ask you to come now and lance the boil and let all that pus and pain out. Let all that abandonment feeling out that nobody cares and nobody pay, even notices and this or that or the other. The kind of things we feel and say when we're going through that long, dark night of the soul. In the name of Jesus, Holy Spirit, just come and fill them up right now. Just come and fill them up right now. I ask you to open heaven, Father, and pour out your mercy upon us in Jesus' name. We want to be a resilient people, a healthy people, a happy people, no matter what. In the name of Jesus. Give him all your confusion right now. <clears throat> I want you to tear that sign off your forehead. Confused. Unwanted. Forgotten. Unimportant. Tear that off of your forehead right now. Tear it off of your heart right now. And reach up into heaven. Take your new name. Beautiful. Wanted. Treasured. Purposed. Ruler over cities. Take your new identity in Christ. And remember the words of Catherine Kuhlman. Just so long as your faith in him is still intact, everything will come out all 